is actually reporting that. So if a prostate MRI is reported by a prostate cancer specialist, then it's obviously much more helpful to me than somebody who may have looked at multiple different types of imaging for other cancers. Uh, Dr. Scarpetto, we've talked a little bit about this already, but do you want to elaborate on the sure. question? Sure, uh, yes. So um, just following up on her comment about MRI. So we know that MRI is very good, but it still misses about 15% of clinically significant prostate cancer. So a Gleason 7 prostate cancer or above. Um, and so we have to keep that in mind. That's why we don't <coughs> forego biopsies yet if a patient has a normal MRI. But I believe in focal therapy. I, I do focal therapy. I think it has a role in the management of prostate cancer. And as long as patients are adequately counseled about the risks and potential for recurrence, I think um, it's, it's a worthwhile treatment. And I'm excited to see ongoing developments there. But um, I, I think it's a, real, it's a real treatment and something that we, we can safely do in patients. We're using MRI much more than we used to. How often does somebody come to you for a consult for focal therapy where you look at the images and you're like, this really isn't a great quality image and have to get re-imaging? Not infrequently. And we all like our own institution best, but um, if I'm concerned about the quality of an MRI, I will just have it repeated at our institution. And I always have patients undergo a targeted biopsy prior to proceeding with focal therapy. Another question on HIFU, why would HIFU be a better treatment? It sounds like it could miss some parts of the prostate and leave cancer there. I think HIFU is a great treatment if it, as she has alluded to before, is done by an experienced provider. Uh, for the reasons that we talked about before, um, we know that the side effect profile is better and we know that um, there are target lesions or index lesions that are responsible for the clinical behavior of um, certain prostate cancers. And so if we can treat that one area, uh, I think that that's, that is a very reasonable way to proceed. Deborah, uh, you talked a little bit about the, uh, the, the conflict about uh, information that's out there, and we've heard this as well from Dr. Scarpetto about the United States Preventative Task Force um, has caused a huge amount of confusion over the last few years. Uh, we're trying to educate men that they should know their numbers, that they should be screened, uh, that they should discuss um, the PSA blood test, and then the next minute you turn on the TV and it says, actually we're not doing prostate cancer screening at all. That there's so much confusion out there in the media, um, and even primary care doctors are confused. So here we are saying to patients, go and talk to your primary care, get a PSA blood test. And then they walk in and the primary, first thing the primary care is saying, well, we, we don't do that anymore and there's, there's no role for that. Uh, can you say a little bit about all the confusion that's out there in the media and about sure. prostate cancer awareness and sure. patients uh, and friends saying, well, I've heard that you can die with it, not from it. What's your thoughts on all that? Um, I think for those of us who are not medical professionals, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, we're not expected to know it all. We just leave that to the doctors. They can answer the questions. They can do the research. They should be up on things. But on the other hand, um, they also, as wonderful as all of the doctors and nurses and everybody else have been, they know their limits, and there are some times when they say, this is your choice. There is no one best treatment. You're a borderline case, for example. Um, and you, you really need to be comfortable with what's right for you. Um, I, I will say, for example, um, I saw Dana's anxiety rise, not clinical, but I saw him you know, get nervous and worried and anxious um, about coming into New York City, a place he knows well. He's worked here every day for decades. Um, that doesn't mean we didn't go to Sloan Kettering for a second opinion, but once the Sloan Kettering guy that we saw said, these are my guys, and I'll be honest, we never had a uh, female provider at all, urology, oncology, radiation, surgeon, parking attendant, <laughs> mm, 
nothing. Um, there were both male and female nurses when he was uh, in the hospital, but other than that, so that's why I say he. Um, and, and so um, it, it's, I think it's really important uh, to figure out what's right for you, because once this Sloan Kettering physician said, these are my guys, they're at this place, this place, and this place, um, you might want to go see one of them or someone else for a second uh, opinion. Don't hesitate to get a second opinion. Um, the problem with it is that doesn't mean your first doctor was wrong. As the doctors will say, there might not be one right thing. So what's most important for you? Dana said, um, I don't care. I mean, I'd rather not be incontinent, I'd rather not be impotent, but I don't care. My main goal is to be alive. Now. There were people who responded to his blog and said, if I can't, <laughs> and I, you know, whatever, I don't want to be alive. That may be how those people felt. Um, Dana's was, you know, first, I I'd like to uh, be around. So I think when you're looking at confusion, you also have to look at what's best for you. You might like what one doctor says best, but Dana said, I would be more comfortable going to MD Anderson, Mayo Clinic, uh, Johns Hopkins, or the Cancer Institute in New Jersey than going back into the city when I'm already going into the city all the time and he's not a big New York fan because he's a rural guy. If that was going to make him crazy every single day, he had surgery, he had radiation, he had hormone therapy, he had a lot of treatment. Um, I said, well, then that's an important factor. So all of the things that can muddle the decision for you um, are things that you really have to take into consideration based on you, you, the patient, and what's right for you. Whilst you, know, you owe it to yourself to get a second opinion, and still I see patients every day who are really embarrassed to uh, go for a second opinion. They're nervous about setting their... Uh, urologists that may have done the biopsy and mm -hmm. um, I always ask for records we're constantly filling in record release forms and some patients are just really uncomfortable with us requesting records obviously you know we're not mind readers it's so helpful um, even if I don't agree which often we don't with the recommendations um, having those records and knowing what has been discussed already um, is so helpful so if you are going for a second opinion. If it makes you feel any better, when patients get records requested from my office, I don't even know. And it's the secretaries who get the record release form, and they're the ones who print out the records. We don't think twice about it. So please don't feel embarrassed. And if there is a doctor who's offended by you getting a second opinion about your prostate cancer diagnosis, that's a red flag, um, because they don't have, if they're, um, so insecure that they're offended by you getting a second opinion, then I would walk away. And, and some patients love to play the game. Well, ooh, I'm not going to tell you what they said. I want to see what you think. And we're human beings, okay? So the more information we have up front, the better it is. And sometimes patients will say, oh, you know, my PSA was 6.2. And then you get the records and it was 62. And that was exactly what happened to my brother's father-in-law who asked for my advice and I said to Abel when we flew him over to New York don't treat him special because if we treat him differently well, I'm going to over treat or under treat a family member and sure enough when we got his records he was completely out with his PSA and it was it was a game changer so don't be afraid to speak out and again if you know you're going for a second opinion, either try and get your records up front so you can walk in with them um, or have them faxed to the office where you're going for a second opinion um, up front. And oh, yeah. don't just check that the fax was sent. Check that the faxes were received because often the patients will say, oh, they sent the records, they sent the records, but we haven't received them or they've not hit the chart for scanning. Can I add something? Um, Dana and I saw um, a number of people for a second opinion, so I guess you'd have to call it second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever. Um, and there was only one uh, physician who said, this is the way to treat you in this situation. This is the only right way, and I'm the best at doing it. 
and we didn't even glance at each other during that appointment, but I knew right away neither of us would be comfortable um, with that particular position. He happened to have a different opinion from all the others we saw, um, which is fine. Maybe he was right, but he was also convinced that anybody else that we saw before him or would see after him wouldn't be right. It just, it didn't sit right, so. Reminds me of that joke, what's the difference between God and a surgeon? God doesn't think he's a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an important point about prostate cancer in general. It's unique in many ways, but there's no right answer often. And going into medicine, we like right answers, we like algorithms, and if A, then B. And with prostate cancer, it's here's A, B, C, D, here are the comparative effectiveness data, here are the comparative effectiveness harms you choose. And so that can be uncomfortable for the patient and it can also be uncomfortable for the clinician because so many times a patient will say, what do I do? What is the right answer? If it was your father, if it was your brother, if it was your husband. And I try and help make that decision, but I am reticent to say, mm. here is the best decision for you. And there really is not a wrong answer with much of prostate cancer management. And to remember, prostate cancer is not a one size fits all. So, so often patients come in and they say, oh, my best friend had prostate cancer. The buddy I play golf with had prostate cancer. But there's a huge spectrum between a low grade, low risk prostate cancer that requires no treatment at all versus somebody who's got large volume aggressive disease. So it's important to remember that and to try and not be too um, directed by what somebody else may have done and what was best for them may not necessarily be best for you. I'm just going back to the questions. I think we have the answer to this. Somebody asked, who did most of the talking to the doctors? You or your husband, Deborah? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I looked at him, you know, each time because the doctors would direct questions to him. Um, and, you know, obviously he can speak for himself and he answered, but um, in terms of thinking ahead and what if and that kind of thing, um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there was ever, uh, he certainly went to many of the radiation appointments uh, without me. Um, I know a big question was, how do you handle this because you're going to work all day and then you're driving an hour to the hospital and then you're, you know, you must not get any sleep. I said, husband dying of cancer, I sleep fine. Wondering where my son is on the transplant, I sleep fine. I just don't have a sleep problem. It makes life a lot easier <laughs> if you get a good night's sleep. That's not true for most people I have heard. Um, so. I was definitely the, the one focused on um, getting answers and thinking ahead to what if, what if, what if. Um, again, Dana was much more big picture. I'd like to stay alive. Um, and I'm pretty sure that the people around me, whether it's you know my wife or, uh, or my clinicians, will take care of the rest of the stuff. Um, so. Just talking about patients who are on surveillance in particular, these are patients who have low-grade, low-risk disease. They've been told they have prostate cancer, often fairly newly diagnosed, and they're coming in every three to six months for a PSA and a rectal exam. And they have a good understanding that the disease is appropriate for surveillance and they don't necessarily need any definitive treatment. And then the guy goes home and says to his wife, uh, you know, I saw the doctor today about my prostate cancer, and the wife said, oh, what did, what did they say? Oh, I'm not really sure, and uh, uh, we're going to kind of monitor it. So often, there's a huge amount of anxiety coming from the spouse, who's often not at the appointment, and understandably, they're thinking, hang on a minute, my husband's got prostate cancer, and the doctors are telling him nothing needs to be done. So I think it's important, especially for those patients on active surveillance, Go with your partner so that they can understand because often the guy's fine with being on active surveillance and the spouse is the one who can't sleep and is saying, look, I really think you should get on with this and have surgery or radiation. You need to treat the cancer. Kristen, do you have that problem arise? I do, and I've tried to take on some of what some of my partners do with written materials. So sitting down with the patient, giving them a handout, writing what 
um, he has down on that paper and then what the recommended treatment options are. And I think, and also we, we give some resources that are credible. I know there's a lot online, but there are some particular websites that do provide a lot of useful, clear, patient-oriented information on prostate cancer. And so providing those resources and then letting the patient know where they are and here's what we talked about is helpful. Another question for you here, Kristen. Are female doctors more or less likely to tell men about side effects? I know that you do prostatectomy as well. Uh, one of the uh, uh, people that emailed in said, I'm pissed as hell that my urologist did not tell me the full story of problems after surgery. Thoughts on that? I don't know if that is a gender-related um, aspect of care. I fully believe in adequate counseling, and it takes only six months in practice to realize that you thought you were doing a good job in training counseling patients, and it's not until you're they're your own and you're sitting where, there with them postoperatively that you realize how important preoperative counseling is. So I'd like to think that all clinicians, regardless of sex, adequately counsel their patients, but. I don't think that there's anything about the nature of prostate cancer treatment that makes female urologists uncomfortable about talking about side effects related to treatment. I agree with that. Uh, Deborah, you made a good point that uh, there were some uh, points that were brought up in the discussion that your husband had forgotten. Uh, maybe you were able to go back to your notes. We know yeah. in the medical literature that patients remember less than 10% of what we tell them in a wow. consultation. Um, we know that, we often forget that. So, and I have patients where when you sit them down and tell them the biopsy, and there are patients in this room that I'm looking at uh, uh, who have been in that situation where you say, where they were clearly expecting a diagnosis of prostate cancer because the MRI was highly suspicious and I'd already told them, there's a very, very high chance that your biopsy will be positive. And yet still, the minute you sit them down and you say, yes, the biopsy is positive for prostate cancer, that's it. They don't remember a single mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thing that was said after that. So remember that you, you must feel that you can ask again and again and again and again. And I spend a lot of my time repeating in the same consultation and also in subsequent consultations, going over what was addressed before. And that's why it's so great when you have an extra pair of ears with you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very generous of you to say that, and I'd like to think that all doctors are willing to do that. But I, I think it's important to remember that when you're the patient, no matter what the disease, um, it's hopefully, the only thing you're going through. I mean, obviously, you might have another issue or two medically, but that's, that's really what you're focused on. And for your doctor, she sees patient after patient after patient after patient, um, as it should be. So um, I, I think it's really important, as you said earlier, to be organized, know what you're going to say beforehand, um, have your stuff all ready, and write down what the doctor tells you. Then you can save that time to ask questions about the two things you didn't understand, rather than those basic questions where, I mean, I, I'd rather my clinician be doing something with her time, you know, that she went to med school to do, or that she perfected in residency, or rather than repeating to me or to my husband the same thing that was already said just because we forgot or we didn't bother to write it down. And maybe I'm not being fair to the patient, but um, you know, I think it's, you, you both have a role, and I think you have to do as much as you can in your own role. And I think that in, in, the, in a busy clinic, if you're getting that sense that you know, I'm just not grasping what they're telling me, um, I need more time, I have a thousand more questions, then I think a good strategy is just to say, well, I've got X amount of information today, and then go outside and book a follow-up appointment, whether it be a week later or two weeks later. So it gives you time to digest what you have been able to understand. But there's nothing wrong with saying, well, I'll, I'll come back in a week's time with my 
partner or my daughter or whoever um, because it, it can often help just to come back on another day and there's nothing wrong with doing that and even if you know what treatment you want I definitely want surgery or I definitely want radiation therapy or whatever it may be and you, you may even know who you want to treat you there is sometimes a, a value in saying well I've already decided I want this treatment with this doctor but sometimes if you go and see somebody else for a second opinion who offers the same treatment, even if you're not going to commit to having treatment with that person, often they'll give you a different slant or different perspective on you know, the recovery, the short, the medium, the long term. You may, they may word uh, a certain side effect in a different way. And I think patients find that very helpful. So it doesn't mean that, OK, you've made your decision, that's it. Any other comments? I think you can also utilize the electronic medical record system that we have now. If you have an appointment, you, you end up with more questions than you came in with, make a follow-up appointment, but in advance of that, you know, email your physician and say, here are the things that I want to talk about today so that you can both be prepared for that upcoming visit. And it's great to be informed and educated but be aware of Dr. Google because, unfortunately, a lot of what's on the internet, it's not up to date, it's not accurate, it's not evidence-based. So that's the beauty of organizations like MailCare, that what's on websites from the American Cancer Society, the American Urology Association, the formal prostate cancer support groups, they have worked with experts in the field and uh, people like Daryl constantly updating the literature all the time. And even with great quality literature that's evidence-based and accurate, it may not apply to you. So patients can often go on the internet and read something that's great quality information, but it may not be relevant to your disease. So I think there's a mug out there that's something about uh, talk to your doctor, not, not Dr. Google or something like that. I can't remember the exact phrase, but... I think it's important to get educated, yes, and we're all proponents of that. But more often than not, Dr. Google can really frighten patients. And often we're Googling around at 11 o'clock at night. Then you're panicking because you can't get hold of anyone and say, oh my goodness, I've read that I've got this, this, and this, and there's nobody to talk to. So uh, please remember that. A couple more questions for you, Deborah. Uh, were you surprised by anything that your husband wrote in the Times? Um, that's a great question. Was I surprised? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, I wasn't... I mean, he wrote about pretty much everything. Um, but again, as I mentioned earlier, he did ask us if there were, you know, things that would just... I was, what I was surprised about, and this is not really the question, I was surprised by the amount of feedback in the comments. I was surprised by the number of people who responded, um, by their willingness to share their stories. Most of them were not writers, the way he is. Um, I was surprised by the isolation of many of the men who responded who were prostate cancer patients. And I don't remember that there were many sisters, daughters, girlfriends. I mean, I remember the wives, and that's probably because I was one. Um, there, I was surprised by how many of the wives asked if they could reach out to me directly. I mean, there's probably no one here that wants to, but if you do, Daryl will give you my email. That's, that's fine. I still communicate with women all over the country. Um, I've never had a prostate cancer patient contact me because we have less in common. But when our oldest son got married three years ago, um, his in-laws live in North Carolina, and there was a blurb in the local paper, and it mentioned that their daughter was marrying so-and-so, the son of Dana Jennings at the New York Times. And this woman contacted my son's mother-in-law in Raleigh, North Carolina, and said, could you please give me the phone number of your daughter's husband's mother? Because I remember when her husband used to write for the, well, you know, so at the time, 
her husband didn't have prostate cancer, but it clicked something in her mind um, later. So, no, I can't think of anything that he wrote that surprised me. We kind of open with We're each not other. going to be taking questions from the floor at the moment, just for anyone who's got their hand up, just a few other issues to address. But you mentioned that when your husband was diagnosed, he was in his 50s. 50 on a, the dot. On the dot. You went to a support group. Most people there were in their 70s. And a lot of patients say this, not just with uh, prostate cancer, but I've certainly spoken to family members and friends with breast cancer. If you don't fit that typical stereotype, often it can add to that awful feeling of isolation. So typically, you know, the average guy who's diagnosed with prostate cancer, you look at the literature from the pharmaceutical companies that shows a guy on the front cover, white-haired, retired, couple of grandkids. But that's not everybody. Right. And we're diagnosing prostate cancer at younger and younger age groups. And I've had patients in their 30s and 40s with prostate cancer who've gone to support groups or they've gone online and said, this, this just doesn't apply to me. And the same with women who are diagnosed with breast cancer under 40. And I think it's important to know that the support groups can offer a huge amount of support for patients who consider themselves in minority groups, mm -hmm. whether you be younger than expected, uh, gay patients, there's a huge amount of uh, information out there now, and Daryl's been a great advocate for the LGPG movement. And in addition, mm -hmm. you know, patients who have metastatic cancer, advanced prostate cancer, will often say, well, I went to this group and everybody's talking about how shall I have surgery, shall I have radiation, shall I have focal therapy? So we have to remember that it's not a one-size-fits-all, and there is um, specific information for people out there. And I think it's important that if you feel that you don't fit into that stereotype, speak out and ask for help that's specific to you. Hmm. Yeah. Kristen, any comments? I agree, totally. Another question, Deborah. Uh, what else besides death were you or anyone else in your family afraid of when your husband got prostate cancer? Um, I think actually uh, him dying was really the only thing um, that concerned me. I mean, I had already been through that situation with him years earlier where the doctors said, you know, you probably won't be able to have kids, um, but he did. And, um, you know, if anybody's a medical professional, I don't know if this will, well, obviously will spark something with you, but for his first illness, um, he drove home from a college reunion, four or five hours, walked in the door, and I looked at him, and he just, he was the wrong color. He was sort of white, his lips were blue, and again, we were in our early 20s. I didn't think there was anything wrong with him, and I said, you don't look great, you know, we should probably just run to an emergency room. And he said, no, I got to shower and, and uh, go into the city to work. Um, so while he was showering, I made a big, this is before cell phones, made a big production of, you know, being on the phone. Uh-huh, okay, we'll be right there. Uh-huh, yep. Yeah. So I told him that my grandmother was in the hospital, uh, which she was, um, and that we needed to go right then, which we didn't. And she was already admitted to the hospital. She had like a kidney stone or nothing important. And, you know, nothing super serious. And we went to the emergency room, and the nurse took one look at him. I didn't even have to say I'm bringing him in. They put him on a gurney. Um, they did some testing, and she said to me, and I quote, and this is in his blog. I remember her saying this. I've never seen anybody with a hemoglobin this low that's alive. Because it was 5.2. And I thought, hmm, like sometimes you just know. So we had, you know, he had been sent home from the first hospital back then saying there's nothing we can do. So I think that was probably the only thing. I didn't realize what the other issues, the side effects of a radical prostatectomy, um, I knew what they were. I didn't realize how much they would affect him. Um, not in his day-to-day -day life. He didn't care about that. He was already changing this bag of you-know-what a million times a day. But he still says now, in a joking sense, you know, well, I mean, I'm not really a man. You know, those kinds of, and I'm like, come on, honey. Um, 
I didn't realize how much that would affect him, both the incontinence at age 50 and the impotence. You, you um, brought up a really great point, which I think we're hugely neglectful of addressing. And that is the financial burden of cancer. You talked mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. having to take time off to go to all these appointments. And I think that we forget that, you know, for patients who have a cancer diagnosis, not just for themselves, but also for caregivers and loved ones who want to be there for appointments. They can't always take time off work. We all know that, especially cancer specialists, we can easily run one, two, three hours late in a busy clinic. Um, there is support out there, um, there is financial support out there, um, and it's not always as well publicised as it should be. So um, I have a TV show, CureConnections.com, um, and we probably recorded about 200 TV shows on cancer. The one show that really stands out where I learnt more than anything else was a TV show that we did about the help that's out there for patients with cancer to address the financial burden. And I think that I want to uh, draw people's attention to that, that so often the doctors don't have a clue about what's out there to support patients who are struggling with the financial burden of cancer. And I think that uh, a lot of nurse practitioners and the support networks, the social workers, often they're untapped resources. So if that's an issue, and, and some of these drugs are uh, you know, very cost prohibitive for patients. Some of the treatments that we're using for patients with prostate cancer are costing up to $8,000 a month. And they, they may or may not be covered by insurance and not everybody has insurance. But there are uh, services out there and it's again a question of going to the right people who are educated. So um, maybe Daryl can say a bit more about that later. Um, but I think it's, a, it's an issue that we're very bad at addressing. And uh, if that's an issue, speak out and see what is available because we actually get emails all the time, don't we, Abel, about um, charitable support for um, helping with financial assistance. And even though we get these emails and we know it's available, often it only comes to my mind when I receive this email and yet it's a big problem for patients. So I think we'll take an opportunity now for a bathroom break and a coffee break, and if anybody has any questions uh, that we've not addressed, feel free to look for us circling. Thank you so much. It's like going to a rugby match or something. Mm -hmm.